you're here for a session on AI and the future of humanity. We're here with Amy Webb. She teaches strategic foresight at NYU Stern School of Business. She's also the founder of the Future Today Institute. Um, we've actually known each other for a very long time. Um, and so I was excited to, to read her book, The Big Nine, um, How the Tech Titans and Their Thinking Machines Could Warp Humanity. Um, and you know what I, what I really took away from this book but how many people here have heard some of like the extreme AI scenarios? You know, super intelligence that takes over the world, um, or or that it's all hype and that you know it's actually all going to be the same. I mean, one one of the things that I think is really great about this book is that it's kind of about AI futures, but it's kind of about these practical scenarios uh, about how AI may work in the future, and it isn't just sort of like a technological projection, you know, it's not just sort of like, well, you know, our computational power is increasing at X amount per year, it's not like that. Um, it actually tries to incorporate social, economic, geopolitical factors into our thinking about um, artificial intelligence, sort of based centrally around uh, the big nine, these nine companies, six in the US and three in China, that have basically centralized most artificial intelligence uh, research AI in the current form um, that we're going to be talking about mostly here is an incredibly data-hungry um, form of technology. And so the companies that control the internet platforms, that, that are the internet platforms, um, have access to that data. And that's made them uh, dominant in the, in the field of AI. And that has incredible implications, both because of the centralization within these companies, centralization within one technical culture, um, and the centralization just within two uh, countries. So to give you a, a sense, and then we're going to get into this conversation, give you a sense of like how large this change is on sort of a technical level. Um, maybe a year or two ago, I was talking with an old friend of mine who ended up um, inside Google in a part of, of Google called Google Brain, which is one of their two big AI research uh, nodes. And they were talking about that they were building these new chips uh, inside Google. And Google hadn't traditionally been known as a chip manufacturer, but they decided they needed these new chips just to do this new kind, uh, not really new kind, but a newly powerful kind uh, of artificial intelligence uh, called neural network. So you build these things that sort of have a vague metaphorical resemblance to the human brain. And so I asked them, you know, um, well, how much of like what Google does uh, will eventually run through this kind of computing architecture, these neural networks? And he said that in 10 years, they thought that Google, 99% of the computation that Google does would run in neural networks. And everything else, you know, that up to like, up to 2018 that Google did, everything, running the web, uh, search, um, Gmail, everything, that would be like 1%. And this new form of computing would be 99%. Um, so that's just on like a technical level, and that has an enormous amount of, of social repercussions. So let's talk about your take, this, this big nine, which is kind of your, your coinage for how to think about this. Um, tell me about the, the two big camps, the sort of American camp and the Chinese camp. Yeah, actually, before I do that, I want to add on to that Google story. Yeah. So uh, every year, Amazon is famous for its managers having to write these six-page memos. Um, for their strategic planning for the coming year. And did you heard about this? Mm -mm. So this year, uh, every, everybody had to include a paragraph explaining how they were going to be using machine learning uh, as part of their core processes. And Amazon um, and Google are both part of the big nine. And this isn't about something that's trendy. It's not a buzzword. I think it feels, artificial intelligence feels in some ways, um, so overwrought, so uh, we've, given it so, we've given it so much weight um, that it feels as though <clears throat> we are living through something brand new. When in effect, artificial intelligence has been in some form of development now for a very, very, very long time. So there are two camps, um, uh, the United States and China. It does not mean that there's not tremendous work being done elsewhere in the world. However, uh, you know, for the past 10 years or so of researching this as part of other things that I've been doing, all roads lead back to these nine companies. Um, and three are in China, six are in the United States. The three that are in China are known as the BAT. That's Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. If you haven't heard of these companies, it's because you wouldn't have an occasion to use them 
outside of China. Um, you could think of Baidu similarly um, to, to Google. So Baidu is a search giant that also happens to have a self-driving car division, is also developing um, you know, frameworks and chipsets and you know, all, all the rest. Um, Alibaba is uh, China's version of Amazon and in some ways dwarfs Amazon's uh, sales and, and margins, primarily because it has so many more customers. Um, and it's an e-commerce giant, also does payments. Tencent is a sort of strange amalgam amalgamation. So it's one part social network, um, it's one part healthcare provider, and it's, a, it's, a, it's also a payments gateway. Um, these are Chinese companies, so the technical, they're traded on the NASDAQ. So they are public companies, but because they are domiciled in China, they are absolutely under the thumb of Beijing, um, which means that uh, right now, at this particular moment in time, China's President Xi Jinping um, is thinking about the context of China's broader future. Um, the global, uh, the social mobility the Chinese people are, are about to go through, and global recession impending sort of aside, China's about to go through a, a, the fastest upward social mobility in, econ in economic terms that we've ever seen before in, in modern human history. So these companies are part of that bigger plan. Um, you know, and it's China. So there's not a lot of governance structure, uh, or I should say there's, there's not a lot of arguing. Uh, over data privacy um, and all the rest. And on the U.S. side? And on the U.S. side, uh, we're in a very, very different situation. So the acronym that I've given to our six of the, of the nine is the G Mafia. So this is Google, <laughs> um, not entirely meant uh, in a derogatory way. This is Google, no, Microsoft. No, the good mafia. The, the good, good mafia. mafia. Yeah, G, yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, uh, IBM, and Facebook. And you know, these companies are publicly traded. They have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders. I do not believe that they are set up to intentionally harm humanity in any way, but we live in a free market economy and collaboration is not incentivized. Competition is incentivized. And um, as a result, prior, uh, speed is prioritized over safety. So they've been developing along their own track and <clears throat> this entire time, um, there's been a sort of transactional relationship on the best of days with DC and our lawmakers. Oftentimes, it's antagonistic. And so we've had kind of the opposite effect in the United States. So in Beijing, there's a consolidation of power, and there's a strong vision for how AI can help uh, you know, President Xi um, sort of rebuild the entire world with China uh, at, the, at the helm of a new world order. Here in the United States, there's just a lot of misunderstanding and you know, um, now calls for breaking up these companies, which certainly have gained, I think, a disproportionate amount of control over our everyday lives. Um, but there's no strategy. There's no central point of view. The previous, the Obama administration did release a paper toward the end outlining some thoughts on the future of AI. The Trump administration uh, released an EO, an executive order, not too long ago, it's not self-executing. There was no money, no staff, no people. Um, so all throughout the government, people are finally woken up to this idea of AI. A lot of times the conversations sort of veer back to future of work, but there's no holistic mm -hmm. viewpoint. And nobody is doing any farther term, longer term thinking on this. So where in the kind of grand sweep of technological history, where do you think we are uh, with artificial intelligence right now? So, <clears throat> My opinion on this differs from other people's opinion on this. Um, you know, we are, I think we are um, sort of in the middle of an explosion that's happening in slow motion. And so there are changes happening all the time, we just don't recognize them. So I think we're on a five to seven decade journey here. Um, and, and a lot of people are trying to figure out, well, when do we make the jump from artificial narrow intelligence which is basically just systems that are capable of doing the same things that we can in a narrow way, like a spam filter on your email. Um, when do we make that leap to artificial general intelligence, <clears throat> which unfortunately we've sort of anthropomorphized. Um, we tend to think of AGI as being walking, talking robots, or sort of like- Hal. Hal, right. 
Um, I would argue that we've already seen the first instances of this. So the other side at Google of the, um, those working on AI, so and this is the DeepMind team, which Google acquired uh, a while back. Um, they, years ago, uh, released a, an algorithm that was capable of beating the world's grandmasters um, playing Go. Uh, so, so that has sort of, um, there's been a lot of really interesting development there, but what most recently happened was that the system learned on its own how to play three games at once and to, to self-improve. This is an example of something called um, multitask hierarchical reinforcement learning, which is a fancy way of saying learning uh, kind of the way that we do. Uh, and I, I would say that that was a, a real world example of AGI. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because people try and make sense of machine intelligence and sort of like the way that humans think because that we're all humans, right? I mean, this is what we're familiar with. And yet, there are many examples of incredibly powerful systems that are already embedded in our lives that just don't work the way that, that we do at all. And you mentioned some of these in your book. I mean, the, it's not just the spam filter, right? It's also um, the ordering of all the content that you see on the internet, basically, um, has been run through these exact kinds of systems. And they kind of came online uh, without anyone really noticing. And one of the best examples of this is, everyone here has probably used Google Translate at one point or another, just to maybe see what some spammer was trying to send to you or something. Um, the Japanese version of Google Translate, there was a, a great article in New York Times Magazine. Um, it, for a long time, worked on a system of rules that had sort of been built for translation, and it had different sort of machine learning components. And then in the background, Google kind of rebuilt the whole thing in a few weeks based on these new kind of neural networks technologies and kind of flipped it on overnight uh, in Japan to the new system. And the improvements were like enormous, you know, tens of percents uh, improvement in the sort of accuracy of these translations. And no one really knew that that had happened. Like they were able to build a system that, that was that much of an improvement in translation. Um, with just feeding um, incredible, incredible amounts of data uh, into the system. And in fact, Google has a, a, a saying around it. They call it the unreasonable effectiveness of data. Um, that basically, you can try and solve a problem with fancier and fancier techniques, but a lot of the time, what they actually need is more and more data. Um, and, and this gets me to the really hard um, sort of policy and political issue around artificial intelligence, which is these companies want and need massive amounts of data to make these new systems and to create these new um, improvements, how do you actually govern their access to that kind of behavioral data? Right, so <clears throat> I, think, I think one of the challenges is that everyday people just aren't aware of all the data that's being scraped um, and used. And you know, the issue is that we, these systems need huge amounts of data, sometimes there's too much, and more data is not necessarily better, but, but they need significant amount of data um, in order to learn and understand us, in order to make decisions about us. This data is not just being scraped from places like uh, your email. So uh, Alexa, um, I'm sure everybody at some point has had a conversation with Alexa. Alexa currently knows um, who you are. Um, so if you, there are multiple voices in the room, they can be trained to distinguish one from the other. Fairly soon, in our, you know, in our very near future, um, Alexa is going to be able to tell your emotional state. So are you, you know, what, compared to your baseline biometric data, are you speaking with a faster cadence? Is the tone of your voice a little higher, a little lower? A little lower? Um, are you a little wobbly? Are you sneezing? Are you coughing? You know, a Amazon is going to know potentially before you do if you've um, had a stroke and you don't know it yet, uh, or if you're an early onset Parkinson's sufferer. I think the issue at hand is that, on the one hand, um, this, is, this is a good use case for AI, right? Uh, home diagnostics. On the other hand, we don't yet have answers to questions like, what is my right to privacy? What is my right to emotional privacy? What is my right to choose when to know if I have uh, some kind of serious medical condition. You know, the challenge is, is that in this country, we don't answer, we don't ask and answer those questions 
until there's a legal implication somewhere, until somebody sues. I would argue that we're facing deep uncertainty going forward, and deep uncertainty requires deep questions. And one of the drawbacks of our democratic system is that we don't have any levers in place to pull to address questions like, who owns your face? Um, you know, who owns, who, who owns your DNA? Everybody's, uh, you know, in, in an attempt to know exactly what percent Irish you are, sending your, your DNA away to places like 23andMe, and China is actively buying up those genetic databases all around the world, and this plugs into AI. We're not asking a lot of these questions. So yeah. as a result of that, people are now a little upset, and this has become a central tenet of, of the presidential campaign. Yeah. Um, so rather than coming up with an elegant solution, because quite frankly, the road ahead is a tricky one, and we are going to need Washington and the G Mafia to collaborate in a meaningful way, um, the, the way forward is not the heavy hand of regulation, as we've always known it. Why isn't, why isn't that the way forward in this realm? Um, like many, take environmental regulation, right? I well, mean. I think this is different. So I think part of the problem is we never, so 30 years ago when the internet became commercially available, nobody envisioned, nobody thought of the internet as a um, public good. And so here we are 30 years later, we don't have a lot of governing structures um, and we have serious and significant problems with uh, misinformation today. On the near term horizon is something called synthetic content. So this is, so we're all familiar with people intentionally trying to fool us um, for nefarious reasons. There's a whole other side of this is uh, there are AI, um, they're called AI influencers. I hate that word so much. but. <laughs> But uh, this is content that's been synthetically generated, um, personalized, and in order for you to have a relationship with it. So, and, and there are good reasons to do this. There's a really interesting video of David Beckham online talking about malaria in many different languages. And his face has been modulated to look like he's actually speaking all of those languages. And the voices come from Google Translate. However, um, pretty soon there's AI There's You can use AI to vocal models to modulate people's voices. So we could see Dave, David Beckham's face giving a very strong, meaningful PSA in his own voice in a language that you can understand. So my point is, there are good use cases for all of this. To regulate, the problem is that regulation tends to be a response to what has already happened. Our regulatory structures don't anticipate what's coming next. It would be hard to, to regulate something that hasn't yet happened. So, you can measure and quantify the carbon in the air, and you can build economic models. You can build, you can build models over time to understand what pollution might look like. We have so many variables within AI and our data that there would be, like, I don't think that there's a mathematical model that would be meaningful that we could build to anticipate. Therefore, the regulation at best would be ambiguous. And ambiguous regulation in this country leads to a whole bunch of court cases while China is unilaterally marching ahead. But how do you get governance and cooperation without at least the threat of regulation, if yeah. not like an actual, like what's the actual mechanism for getting these companies to come to the table? Because in a lot of ways, the American markets are not the core of what they're doing in a lot of cases. We're a mature market, they're trying to grow elsewhere, and they're, they're fully you know, multinational companies at this point. So, and that's, that's a great point. I mean, the, the combined wealth of the G Mafia effectively make them as powerful as a nation state. So, I mean, we're, we're you know, the, and, and it's not just money, it's also our data. And by the way, the government and, and various people can, can, can rail against Amazon all they want. The federal government doesn't have its own cloud. The, the government runs on Amazon. So we, you know, we have arrived at a point, I mean, it's true. So, We've arrived at a point that is complicated. Um, I think that cre furthering this antagonistic relationship between not just DC and the West Coast, which is the Valley plus Bellevue and Seattle, but also our third financial, our, our third epicenter of power in this country, which is which is New York, the markets. Um, you know, I think that each each one of those three capitals of our country believe that they have all the power. They're in a horrible codependent relationship. 
Um, there, there are ways, I think, to incentivize them to work together where everybody wins. Um, I can give you a concrete example, but it's... Yeah, sure, give me a concrete yeah. Okay, you're, you're not gonna like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've been playing around for, for a couple of years now with a new kind of digital dividend. There have been digital dividends that have been... Well, thought, explain the general concept of digital dividend. Sure, so uh, my, my job is to do long-term modeling using data. So if it's the case that the Social Security Trust is on shaky ground, we know the job market is, is not great, we have fewer people paying in, we have many more people aging, so we've got a lot of economic uh, challenges. And our social safety nets um, are, are not forward thinking, they're stuck many years ago. And, and the very fact that we talk about a net versus a trampoline tells us something about uh, what's coming. So here's the thing that I've been hashing out. What if uh, we used um, distributed ledger technology, blockchain, don't, don't judge. I, no, I'm not judging. <laughs> yeah. What if we used distributed ledger technology um, to track every single packet of data that moved at any given time? The way to think about blockchain um, and immutable ledgers is it's, if you had like a spreadsheet that was stored in a central spot and anybody could put stuff on the spreadsheet, but once it's there, nobody can take it away uh, or change it. Um, that, that's sort of the, one of the core concepts of blockchain. So what if we were able to track every single packet of data as it moved, and we were able to tag those packets that had a commercial implication? So um, my data uh, earned Google and some advertisers some, some money. Um, at that point, we, we would have transparency and authenticity. Uh, we, as individuals, would also be able to say, uh, yes or no to having that data being monetized. And then if it was monetized, there's some fraction of a cent every single time um, that, that data transfer moves along. Here's why I think that is a potentially interesting proposal going forward, because we don't currently have a federal office that would be in charge of that. That doesn't fall under the IRS, that doesn't fall under, right? And that's a good thing, because we would need to restructure a little bit um, how our current government works with regard to technology, because right now um, there, there's a lot of siloing and, and separation. Mm -hmm. This would be a good thing uh, for the G Mafia because it would allay, it, it would force them to address some of the issues that we have around privacy and around the concentration of wealth. And ultimately, um, this would be a short term sacrifice. But the math that I've done looks like it scales over time. And that comes back to us. So it's not Like it would kick back money. So, that's right. the, the so scheme it would, all would be, be uh, all these transactions that are going on out there using your data. That's right. The money, some percentage of that money gets kicked back to the citizenry. That's right. And because that system would be easy to game, um, meaning the more, you s the more time you spent clicking, the more you would potentially earn back, um, my thought is that this goes into a new kind of trust and then it's, it's uh, divvied out in a meaningful way. Oh. So, so, here's, so here's why I like this idea so much. Because it's not just, the, the, the big tech companies have done terrible things. We all agree. Um, however, we need the big tech companies going forward because not only, you know, there, there is a tremendous amount of promise um, with AI. AI uh, techniques can help us meet serious healthcare challenges and help, help us come up with wild new approaches to, to, uh, to you know, addressing cancer and precision medicine and all of these things. But that only works if we can get data out of EMR, uh, electric medical records. That only works if we can trust them. It's this, it's this mm -hmm. huge, horrible web. So my thought is if, if we can figure out a central node and force everybody to come to the table, in this way, there's no punitive action. There's no arguing. There is a forced amount of collaboration where everybody has to give up a little bit, but everybody wins much more in the longer term. I think, like, I mean, it's an interesting proposal. I mean, I think um, one of the things that I, I think has become very difficult when we've been thinking about the data that we generate on the internet. Um, how many people here have heard uh, Shoshana Zuboff's term surveillance capitalism? People, have people heard about it? Uh, so I'll try to explain it really quickly. Um, Basically, you're moving around on the internet. 
you're having human experiences online, right? You're generating data by sending emails, by clicking on things, by you know, reading the New York Times and, and these various things. And that's kind of like what we've generally thought of as kind of like your data that you've been generating. But out there in the world, many companies then process that data. Um, she calls the, our behavioral data uh, behavioral surplus, that essentially there's a part of that data that's used to improve your service. So, you know, catch spam better and do all these wonderful things that actually are, in fact, legitimately wonderful that uh, technology companies have been able to build. And then there's the surplus, which is then used to train artificial intelligences, um, sell you ads, and, and do other kinds of things. And I think what's tough is figuring out, is our data that raw material, and that's the thing that we have control over? Or is our data the sort of processed predictions about what it is that we're going to do in the future, which allow technology companies to predict what we're going to buy on Amazon um, or who we're, going to, who we're going to connect with on Facebook? And sort of what level of control you want to give in any kind of privacy framework? Um, well, I think there's two issues. Yeah. There's a couple of issues here. Part of it is, so here's another example. Um, Walmart has been working on a connected shopping cart. This is not in market yet, but they've, Walmart's actually a fascinating company in terms of its R&D on data and AI. Um, so they've got this shopping cart in development, and the idea is you, you put your hands on the shopping cart when you get into the store, and it takes a baseline read of your biometrics. So what's your temperature, uh, what's your heart rate, what's your perspiration rate, what's your grip strength, and then as you move throughout the store, it's looking for fluctuations in, the, in that data. Um, so if you get to, to the cereal aisle and your kids are screaming at you <laughs> and all you want to do is find the stupid Captain Crunch cereal uh, and your heart's palpitating and now you're sweating and you know, you're gripping down really, really hard on the shopping cart, the shopping cart pings a store associate who comes over to aisle 18 or wherever you are to make sure that you're not going to blow a gasket. Now, um, that... Again, this is where these conversations, I think, require much more nuance than we've been willing to give them. On the one hand, this is potentially a useful thing. I hate going into, I don't shop in the real world because I don't like not finding things, <laughs> and there are no more humans. There's not a lot of humans in these places, right? So, and I know that's a, a common frustration. So this is a way to summon a person to have a human connection. Um, you know, it, it, through a weird technology system, but... It's going to be sitting there gripping like crazy. That's right. Screen, oh, yeah. I just want to talk. Um, yeah. <laughs> right, so, so on the one hand, this is technology that, that brings us together and in fact does something that AI cannot do. Um, it brings us close to another person who can look at us and talk to us and uh, help us feel better. That is something that, that AI... Uh, and certainly not an anthropomorphized version of AI can do at the moment. Now, the other side of this is privacy. Um, you know, and privacy is, is a difficult one because we all have a very different relationship and viewpoint on privacy. Um, you know, so how, how okay are you with, for example, Walmart, knowing your perspiration rate as you move <laughs> throughout the store? The, yet the other side of this is the commercial side. So if it's the case that this system is going to help me maybe find medicines or groceries or whatever, I'm going to be marketed to in a way that's more meaningful, wouldn't we rather have that than the constant assault of banner ads and commercials and nonsense that's totally meaningless, meaningless content to us? And yet on the other side, this makes us you know, more vulnerable. These are complicated questions. And the problem is that we are not giving these questions any time or any real thought because there is so much capital flowing into AI in this country that to ask and answer any of these questions, to ask what it means that there is human DNA inside of all of these systems and the people whose DNA that is is a relatively small homogenous group, you know, it would slow things down and nobody wants to slow anything down. Um, you know, you have a really fascinating discussion in the book about who it is that's, that's building AI. Um, what you call them like the AI tribe. Can you tell us a little bit about like, sort of where do these folks come from who are building these tools and embedding their values sort of into decision making out in the world? Sure. And again, this, uh, this, is, this is a, this is, 
the data are statistically relevant, but it is somewhat a generalization. Clearly, there are lots of different kinds of people who work within AI, but overwhelmingly, they are white and male. Um, and overwhelmingly, in this country, and overwhelmingly, they, they go to the same schools, um, and the schools are terrific, uh, but the schools, if you look at the student body, tend to be, there's, there's not a lot of change. And you'll hear people, especially when we're talking about diversity, um, talk about a diversity pipeline problem, and there's just, there's just not enough people. The issue is that there's not enough people being selected, being nurtured, you know, being brought into these systems, um, not just students, but also teachers and the professors. And now here's the really, so AI tribes are over, overwhelmingly uh, white and male. They are overwhelmingly um, homogenous in their political views and their religious views. And that's important because- Which is actually like fairly, for those who still think of Silicon Valley as like a libertarian yeah. haven. It's basically just kind of standard Democrat. Yeah, but now here's the issue. Because when we talk about discrimination, when, when I mention discrimination, like I get a lot of eyes glazing over. We've heard that before. Yes, yes, we know the black people are being left out. This is not exactly what's going on. What's happening is that, you know, all of us have different worldviews. We've all grown up in different places with different ideas. All of us in some way are being discriminated against. Because if you're not part of this small rarefied group that had a shared experience that went through the same intense, these classes are very intense in school, that tend to live in the same places that then went to work for the same companies, and there's a whole bunch of transients between these companies. You, you, you get Googlers going over to Facebook, you know, going over to Microsoft, um, which is in fact one of the interesting stories about the Valley is, is this sort of movement between places. That means everybody else is being left out. Can I give a quick example? Yeah. All right, so I broke both of my ankles. It's another story for another time, <laughs> but that's why I've got this. So um, I, norm I have the TSA Pre, so normally I whiz in and out of airports through the, the cool uh, metal detector thing. Um, because of all the metal now, I can't go through the metal detector, I have to go through the scatter ray um, machine. So, and this is the one that most people go through. So I, I go through this machine, fully expecting, because I can't walk, them to say, um, this is different because with the, with the, that's AI. So this system is looking at your body and it's comparing it to a baseline of other bodies. So obviously my cast is an anomaly. So I, and I'm a curious person, so like I get on the other side of the machine and I'm looking at this TSA guy who's looking at me and I'm looking at the screen. You know that screen that has the big boxes? So here's what's fascinating. Um, this obviously was like a big block of yellow and then my head was a block of yellow and, and like my breasts were also a big block of yellow. And so I'm like super fascinated by what's going on here. And I watched, and I had to wait forever to have somebody, you know, Swab examine your me. your cast or right, something. Right, because, yeah. you know. So I watched, there are a couple of other women go through. Same thing, breasts. And now I'm wondering, what is, what's going on here? Because, uh, I don't think I'm that different from everybody else. Anyhow, I then did some research. It's under wire, right? So a lot of women are like, yeah, we know that. And a lot of the men in the room are like, I don't know, still, I've tuned out when you said breasts. Um, or maybe you tuned in, I don't know. Um, here, here's what's interesting. If you have, uh, so I have enormous, very, very thick curly hair. I bet, does Sarah ever yeah, set yeah, it yeah, off? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay, his wife also has enormous, thick, much prettier curly hair than I do. Um, the people who built the system were not people who are familiar with enormous hair or weaves uh, or bras with underwire. I don't wear underwear that is all that fascinating. It's fairly <laughs> normal underwear, but the system wasn't trained to recognize me. Why? Because somebody like me wasn't in the room when the corpora was built, the, the data set was built, when the algorithms to use that data were built, when the testing was done, when the learning was done, that entire chain of decision making excluded me, which now means that when I go through this stupid machine at the airport, I can expect somebody to get very, very familiar with me simply because I'm wearing a normal piece of underwear that nobody anticipated during that process. That is the problem with AI tribes. That's a small inconvenience. Now, you know, we, you and I could probably spend three hours going through serious infractions in our criminal justice system, um, s serious ways in which this is being used uh, to, to really hurt people. Yeah. 
So um, we're going to go to questions in just a couple of minutes. Um, but I wanted to give you a chance to, you do have some proposed solutions and tweaks the system in the book, uh, global governance body, sort of a set of principles for, for AI development. Um, what do you want them to take away uh, of you know, the, the, the hopeful paths and nudges that can be given to this technology? Um, so the, the third part of the book are concrete proposals intended for people who work uh, in AI, people who work in policy, um, but also everyday people. So the everyday people piece of this is really interesting and important to me, and it should be to you. By any chance, does anybody remember the Google, this was, I think this was last winter, um, there was a thing where you could submit a photo, a selfie, and see what fine art photo you look like? Mm -hmm. Fine art, so, so how many of you did that, just out of curiosity? Okay, <laughs> um, and then you probably shared it back out. So here's the thing, that was you um, training an AI system. And I don't, I mean, on the one, yes, you probably heard, a, you saw Manet that you never saw before, wonderful. Um, I just think we ought to be more skeptical. We, we are living through a period of unbelievable uncertainty, and as I mentioned, that requires deep, deep questions. It requires us to not close our eyes and drift away just as the machines are waking up. So this is important because, you know, we, we are on a long develop, developmental track. So we have to start asking more questions. If you are involved with politics, you have to demand of, the, of your politicians that they take a smarter approach and not just a blunt hammer to addressing these issues. Um, you know, think about who's using your data and why, and if you're, not comfor if you're comfortable with it, great. If you're not, then don't blindly give it away. Um, and there are probably lots of powerful people in the room. Um, w this is not just Silicon Valley's problem. So we, big tech grew to this outsized proportion in part because everybody in DC just kind of turned a blind eye. We never developed the relationships that there should have been. Um, so there's something that all of us can do, and I guess I'll, I'll end with Vint Cerf, who's a wonderful person, uh, who developed the, the initial protocols, the TCP IP protocols that became foundational for the internet. Um, he has this analogy about a pebble and, uh, and, and a, a big boulder. So let's say that we're all villagers, that we're at the base of a mountain, and at the top of the mountain is this enormous boulder that looks like, you know, for years it kind of didn't move, we kind of ignored it, we knew it was there, but we, you know, we just didn't, we didn't uh, worry about it. And now we start to see some movement. And in fact, maybe it looks like this boulder is gonna come and crush us all. It's gonna gather steam and, and move down this mountain. There is no way that any one of us is going to stop this catastrophe from happening. However, if we're smart about it and we each pick up a pebble and we march up that mountain and we put a pebble in just the right spot, it's not gonna stop the boulder from coming down, but it might divert it. And if everybody picks up a pebble, we might be able to divert this boulder into a different spot. That boulder is artificial intelligence. And, and there is a looming catastrophe, and it's not robots coming to murder us in our sleep. All right? We, we have to stop talking about the future of artificial intelligence the way that it's been framed as robots coming to murder us, robots coming to take all of our jobs, or robots magically ushering in a, a world in which nobody has to work anymore uh, because everything is being done for us and we're all living happy, fulfilled lives. That is not the future. The future is much, much more complicated. Uh, and it's on us to investigate that and to find a pebble, to pick it up, and to start marching up the mountain. All right, let's take some questions. I've got them. Oh. Um, we've got one right there. Amy, uh, I'm from Silicon Valley, and I have a good friend of mine who is a senior AI scientist with one of the companies you mentioned. And he has a very negative view about job destruction or job creation over the next five to 10 years. And then my second question is, you know, you, I love your idea about supplementing Social Security, but how much money are we talking a year per person? Yeah. So I will just, I'll start with the second question first. Um, uh, the math, I haven't finished working on the math um, over time. So one of the, 
variables that's a little rough right now is our, popul our population and growth curve in the United States. So um, it could range from, my, my initial goal was to reach parity with um, the median social security. Um, so I, I will just say that I, the math hasn't yet worked out. But I don't, I don't think it would approach these sort of universal basic income um, fantasies that people are spinning where we just will never have to work again. Um, that's a terrible idea for society. I, if you look back throughout history, it's, you get a whole bunch of people not working. Um, we're not gonna magically go and you know, learn Latin because now we have all this free time. Free time doesn't work out well uh, for, for people. So we need to have a purpose and we need to do some kind of work. That leads me to your first question. Um, so technological unemployment and displacement is important. Um, we are so fixated on the wrong pieces of that conversation though. If I walk into one more, oh my God, I was here, I, different meeting, but I was on this campus listening to somebody talk about how they were gonna teach all the coal miners in West Virginia how to code. And everybody applauded um, this wonderful idea. And all I could think of was, so you're gonna take somebody who has never had to sit for eight hours in their life, plop them down at a computer where they don't have any fine motor dexterity built up because they've never had to do this all day long. You're gonna teach them things that are weird, right? If, illogical to the way that the person has been thinking. And then uh, within about you know, three years, the machine learning self-generative code that a lot of these firms have already built is gonna obviate this job that this person is now doing. So. Um, I think you could teach them fairly easily. It's just, you've gotta well, get that's great, jobs. There's like, not that many jobs. Well, any job that you're gonna, the level of sophistication, it right. doesn't make sense. Yeah. It's a, it's a and, and, but that is so American. We are so fixated on short-term solutions while avoiding long-term risk. That's kind of like our MO. We are a nation of nowists. So when we think about jobs and job displacement, we think about right now. We think about truck drivers. We think about people doing manual labor. Here's the rub. Um, the fine motor skills of robotics are not gonna be where we need them to be over the next two decades. And at the moment, we have a sharp decline in the trades. So there's actually gonna, so while everybody's freaking out about the poor truck drivers, What's actually happening is we don't have enough plumbers. Like we don't have enough people who are trained electricians. And maybe someday in the future, a robot will come in and fix your toilet, but all of us have different toilets. I mean, th this is, it sounds silly, but this is an actual real need. The people who are gonna see job displacement, white collar workers. <laughs> so, and nobody wants to acknowledge this, but every professional services firm, accounting, consulting, uh, law firms, uh, you know, they are, they are built on a triangle model, right? So you have all, you're, you, you make most of your money at the bottom through many, many, many billable hours uh, with work that can already be done better um, by AI systems. So, and that's actually critically important because you take away um, that segment of the population from our economy, we start to see different collapses in ways that we're not yet modeling. So. But, but, it, but I'm not, a, when I go in and have these conversations with folks in DC or economists, like no, nobody wants to have that conversation. That's an uncomfortable conversation because it's threatening to the very people we're having the conversation with. So we've got a mic. Um, yeah, she's coming this way, so we'll come, we'll go to this one over here. Can you, can you, uh, just, just to build on that, oh, sorry. Oh. Oh, okay. go ahead. Just to build on that, how do you get the right people in the room then to build these algorithms if they're temporary jobs most likely because once you train, you're pretty much done training? Right, so um, I, I think that gaining, we've, we've had this obsession with STEM education in our country for a very long time now, but it's, I think it's starting to reach fever pitch. So our obsession with STEM has, manifested in these programs where every kid must learn how to code. Okay, not every kid is learning the foundations of logic and philosophy. And if you model out over a long period of time, what are the things that we're going to be able to do that the computers cannot do? It's that. 
critical thinking. Um, so <laughs> somehow it's, it's this pendulum. We have this, again, the, and the people designing the training programs and the curricula, this is what I find this fascinating. Um, if you are in conversations with those people and look at those people and evaluate those people, a lot of times it's their fears that get built into the curricula. So the people built, looking at the future of education, building a lot of these programs out are quite a bit older. And they themselves are concerned. What, what we see being built into all of these programs is a fear and an anxiety based on what the people building these things they themselves cannot do. Um, China has taken a totally different approach. So here's another reason to be potentially concerned. So um, in China, there is now a textbook that, that is gonna be rolled out nationally, I think next year, starting in kindergarten, teaching kids not to code, but the foundations of the kinds of thinking that will, over many, many years, position them to work in conjunction with and in partnership with AI systems in kindergarten. Um, I live in Baltimore part, like half the week, and the other half of the week I live in New York. Um, like Baltimore schools don't have books, okay? Baltimore schools don't have like, you know, utensils and other things that they need. So I'm not, so while everybody's fixated on every kid must code, um, we've somehow forgotten that every kid must also learn how to read and write um, and we're not providing the basics, you know, tools for them to be able to do that. It's a messed up way of thinking. You know, I actually, I've been thinking a lot about um, the diversity conversation in Silicon Valley, and one of the thing that, things that I think is an underestimated strength of the Valley when it comes to diversity is that you have actually an incredible in-migration of like East Asian, South Asian coders and executives and one of the things that's really interesting, these are huge countries with their own like amazing diversity of thought. Like you, you, know, you go to India and it's, there's all kinds of different people there with different political allegiances. And yet they're all kind of coming to the valley and bringing that interesting perspective. And I think that you know, in a lot of companies, particularly on the more technical side, I mean, if you were to add up East Asian and South Asian employees, it's like 50% of the company. Um, and so I think if we can leverage some of those people and the diversity uh, of cultures and thought that they represent, I actually think it can be a way out of some of the diversity conversations, which, you know, to be honest, like we kind of failed on diversity. You know, the needle's not moving in any of these companies for, for black people or, or for Latinos. So it's... Um, Google, Google finally made some of their data available on their, uh, the diversity of their, of their workforce. So it was yeah. like a couple years ago, they finally made it available, yeah. and then they released a report the second year, and there was like a 0.01% uptick, yeah. which, now, we can't yeah. expect entire systems to yeah, change yeah. over 12 months, but I, there's, there's, there's just not enough right. Transparency movement. was the first step, is the way I see it, but there's, That's true. there's a lot That's more true. To, to be done. Yeah. Um, we have room for one more. Let's go here. Uh, comment a little bit more on the regulatory issue, because they're pretty clueless in Washington, D.C., and the, the companies, I don't think, are getting ahead of the argument, and stupid might win. Those are all fascinating thoughts. Um, so let me say this. I do a fair amount of work um, with uh, various departments uh, in DC. Uh, here's what I will say. I think that there are extraordinarily talented people uh, some very, very sharp people who understand these problems and who are very good long-term thinkers and planners. The challenge is democracy. You know, we have, a, uh, we, have, we have a revolving door. One of the great things about this country is that we don't like who's president. Every, you know, a couple years later, we can elect somebody new. We don't like our representatives, same deal. Um, the problem is that we don't have, there, there used to be something called the Office of Technology Assessment, uh, which was defunded uh, by Gingrich um, in the 90s. But, but this office, it had one role, and that was to study and model long-term futures uh, and to advise in a non-political way everybody who had to make policy. Once, and that, that model became the gold standard for many other countries around the world. We no longer have anything like that. And so the problem is that um, we have very smart people 
but we have no mechanism to do this longer term planning. And in the process, there are no, develop, there are no relationships being developed. The procurement process is unwieldy and horrible, and so that creates further friction between DC and the tech companies. Um, you know, and uh, our political cycles have become ever more uh, cantankerous. So we have to figure out a, a different path forward because you know, I could rattle off t names of 20 different people within the Pentagon and the State Department um, and OSTP who are great, who are great people but who unfortunately have to wait on political appointments or on cycles to turn around. And, and that is, that, that is gonna put us at a profound strategic disadvantage as we go head to head with China. Last thing on China, if I may. Um, I know there's a lot of scaremongering right now. Uh, and for those, you know, some of you may remember the 80s when we had some of the same with Japan. I've lived, I spent years living in both Japan and in China. Here's what I'll say. I think that this time is different. I think that we have failed to see for many years China as a militaristic, diplom uh, diplomatic and economic pacing threat. And I think now that we have started to come to that realization, we need leadership. We need a point of view and we need to incentivize collaboration. What I'm seeing is the opposite. There are now all of these independent groups within government. There are all these independent groups within different universities who are all launching their own AI ethics and their own viewpoints and their own, like everybody's going at it alone, which is causing a diffusion of funding and talent. So in absence of strong leadership and some kind of central idea for how we are going to approach the future, China is going to skip ahead of us in ways that nobody is yet thinking. Um, and, and given what I've modeled and the data that I have access to and what I've seen, I don't wanna end on a terrible note, but I'm going to, um, I am very, very concerned about where we are headed. And I'm even more concerned that somehow in the middle of all this, we are all distracted and we are all anxious and we are forgetting that the decisions that we make today have reverberating effects for many years to come, which tells us that we have to start asking better questions. And the answers that we get may not be the ones that we love, but we have to be willing to make short-term sacrifices for longer-term good. And I'll make that, I'll actually accept the premise that that's what's going on inside the United States, incredible decentralized uh, market-driven version of thinking around uh, artificial intelligence. And I see it as an incredible test of this system. I mean, this is the way the American system has worked for a really long time. And it looked like we were gonna get smoked at various times in history by, by Soviets, by Japanese. Um, but still a relatively short period of time, and we are the anomaly. If you, throughout totally. history, authoritarian rule always seems yeah. to win out. I'm not gonna say we're gonna win. I'm just gonna say this is a fascinating test of whether our sets of institutions, our decentralization, and our version of market uh, capitalism can rise to this challenge. Thank you very much. Have a great session.